Okay. Yeah. So you guys, um, first thing I guess, anybody have homework to turn in? I know a couple of you put it on classroom. It's fine. Anybody have hard copies to give to me? In progress. In progress. It's fine. Just try to keep up on it. I'd like you. Again, we're reviewing unit by unit to try and like, okay, what was momentum all about? And I want you to practice. Like I told you, we, I'm giving you some flexibility where this unit that we're doing is AP review. This unit will last for a while. So I'm, I'm going to get let you guys take advantage of that. And you got one? Yeah, I need three. Okay. Is your name on it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in any of the old ones that you haven't done, you can turn into me. Um, but I'm wanting you to stay on top of this. Don't dig yourself a hole of, oh, geez, I didn't do any of the reviews, and maybe the AP test is tomorrow. That would not be a good situation. Then you're going to get a bunch of zeros, and you haven't been reviewing for the AP test. So don't, avoid that, Aiden. All right, can you talk about the elephant in the room? The 3D printer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a second. I, I, I want you guys, you can turn these in late, right? You could turn unit one review into me right now. Full, pro, full credit, right? It's not a big deal. But don't be digging yourself a hole. There's a lot of you guys that don't have any of them or only have half of them. Just get them done as we're reviewing. I don't want this to pile up and, you know, backfire on you. Um, today... I don't have the AP mock exams finished. I have multiple choice done, and I have half of the free response I was able to grade in the random spare time I had over the weekend. You observe the multiple choice Huh? You need to look at the multiple choice and you know how you did. Well, that's, that's what I want to... In, in my head, I wanted to take a full class period and review the whole exam. Well, I feel like the multiple choice alone is if we want to like look at it and review it. It could be. It could and then be. You could save another day for the for the response. That that's fine. And, I'm, and we have time to do that. But in my head, I was thinking, well, I kind of want to get through reviewing unit by unit because we still got today. I had planned unit five. And I got six and seven. Would you guys be okay waiting until we get so the next three classes do finish all of our unit reviews, then review the AP test? I'm kind of curious on. How bad or how good I did on the mock? Well, it really doesn't matter. Well, it kind Ultimately, of does, no, you, no, 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 no. You, can you, you tell know. if I said you got a seventy percent of the multiple choice? What AP score did you get? If you, if you, you have know no idea. It wrong, doesn't matter. You know how we oh, yeah. did, then we can know where our areas of weakness are, where we actually need to be focusing. I, I know. I, I understand that logic, and I use that all the time. Like I tell you guys to grade yourself on the homework, so you figure out what you went wrong and learn from it. What I'm telling you is, if I just tell you, okay, the multiple choice is done, if I give you your score, you have no idea what the AP score would correlate to. I would have to give you the answer key, which might not even help you understand what you missed. So that would take me walking through problem by problem. What I'm saying is I'm wanting to finish the unit reviews, then go back and like look at, okay, you missed these questions on the AP like question number four, the multiple choice, we can do that one together. And that be the review of I miss this one, what I miss, how do I learn from it? You get what I'm saying? Because I, I don't really want to do it right now because I want to get through all of our units and then go back. That way when we're reviewing everything in the AP test, any material on the test we've reviewed. Right? Because we still got five, six, and seven to review. I also don't have the FRQs done, so I'm still working on those. I'll be able to give you a predicted AP score. It's really complicated and weird to figure that out, but I have a way to like take your actual scores and estimate, you know, this is your approximate AP test score from 1 to 5. Uh, but I'll be able to give that once I finish all the grading. You guys should have seen I gave you guys all um, scores for the mock exam. If you took the mock exam, you got it. Virtual students, since that was too much logistics to do, um, yours is just exempted, so it doesn't count for or against, so it doesn't matter. Um, so I was helping you guys out with that. Gave you guys credit for, you know, suffering through that long 
test. It's a really good opportunity. I'm, I'm glad that this school actually does formal mock exams rather than me taking my class time to do it, which I would have anyway. Um, Hmm? Yeah, yeah, I would have done half and half. It would have been like one whole class was you guys get to do the multiple choice. The next whole class, you get to do the FRQ. Um, elephant in the room, yes, 3D printer. I'm, I got Mr. Felger to help me a second time and make sure I know what I'm doing. 3D printing isn't just, oh, make it, send print, hit print. It's really complicated. There's lots of settings you can adjust. Um, so this is from engineering class. I'm printing a sample right now, a sample measuring cup. I'm just doing a basic one. I wanted to test it, make sure it was working. That way, they're making custom measuring cups, right? So what was the main goal of the your guys' measuring cup design, Brody? Uh, to have uh, four different measurements in the same cup instead of having them all like that. Yeah. So their goal was instead of having a tablespoon, a teaspoon, a quarter cup, and a half cup, it's to have a single measuring cup that could do all four measurements. Why has no one done that? <laughs> <laughs> there is, there are they measuring are, cups right that have indentation. I'm sure the there's some. So yeah, there's measuring cups that have indentation that show you where a fourth of the cup, half of the yeah, cup. Yeah, yeah, like a classic cup and it's got markings. But this one is different shapes that hold different. And the idea would be like, if I make cookies, I need one tablespoon of salt, like it so it fills up that spot. And then I have another slot for a half a cup, so then I pour in flour. It all goes in one cup, and then I put it in the bowl, and I'm done. Then so the flour will stick to whatever liquid ingredient you previously put in there. It, you, you, don't, you wouldn't measure dries and solids and liquids together. Yes, yeah, so like, like, you can you use, you'd it have, you'd like, have, use it for something that's like wet and then you put it in and then you go do something dry. It's That's why you'd have to be smarter than the tool and do the dry stuff first, then the liquid. But you can't do that all the time. Sometimes you have to do it in a certain order. <laughs> then don't do use this engineering <laughs> solution. Go back to old school. It, it's just, that's their, it's like a mini project. Um, so I'm testing this to make sure it works. Um, and then I'm going to actually print. So the ones that they're making, their group, like Brody, his group is making one, I'm going to actually print it for them. And then we're going to test them. Um, okay. Uh, physics. Sorry, we were slightly off topic. Huh? You, gotta, you said you're going to test them. You're going to make something? No. The they issue, bomb. you could use these to actions. The issue is it's layer by layer. So you have lots of crevices in a 3D printed measuring cup. If you used it once, not a big deal. But it's really difficult to clean it in a sanitary way. So like if you measured liquids or food, those particles get stuck in there. So over time, your measuring cup would get full of bacteria. So Brody, remind me to clarify to your class that when I actually print them for you guys and you test them, that they can't actually be used for food. Because they're not gonna stay sanitary and it could be a health hazard. Are they dishwasher safe? I don't think so. Well, as I guess as long as long as it stays under like four hundred degrees, I think it would. As and, and as long as you don't have like a jet cycle that blasts it apart, because they the nozzle prints at like approximately four hundred degrees. That's the temp it needs to melt, just enough to melt it, and then it cools quickly. Anyway, anyway. So today I want to review momentum. <laughs> Bad idea. Um. Momentum, I want to review quickly. Equation um, for momentum. If I ask you for the momentum of an object, what? Yeah, good. B equals mv, right? Again, you got your equation sheets. So you don't need to have it memorized. It's helpful if you do. Momentum was described by the term p. Um, some class, some you'll see it as a row, that weird letter. Although other science classes use rho as density. And I think your equation sheet does it that way. Momentum is a P. Density, I think it's the very bottom left, is mass over volume. That is a rho, that Greek curly P, that's density. So for this class, since AP chose to do it that way, a P is what you 
used for momentum. And Brody's got it. Momentum is equal to the mass of an object multiplied by its velocity. Very similar to kinetic energy. But momentum and energy, that they're not quite the same thing. Right? 1 half mv squared is kinetic energy. That was unit 4. This is momentum. It's just the mass and velocity. And you just multiply them together. Okay? Momentum. You want to think about it. Remember inertia? Remember what inertia was? It was a private matter. Bingo. That's absolutely true. <laughs> yes. Inertia is a property of matter. Can you kind of describe what inertia was? Like, what does that mean? An object that's moving wants to keep moving. Yes. Stops. And when it's the opposite, so if it's stopped moving, it wants to stay stationary. Exactly. John hit the nail on the head. He said an object that it's moving, it wants to stay moving. Doesn't want to slow down, doesn't want to change direction. Its inertia is a property of its mass, and if it's in motion, it wants to stay in motion. If an object's sitting on a table and it has mass, it does not want to move. It will resist motion. So momentum is inertia or mass in motion. That's kind of a, a conceptual catchphrase. P equals mv. Notice, what does this little arrow above any variable mean? It's a vector. It's a vector. Notice, mass does not have an arrow. Mass is not a vector. Right? A bowling ball has a mass of 10 kilograms. There is no direction associated with the mass of an object. It's just a number. That, by the way, is called a scalar. Just a number. Stop. We're not going to bring that back up. Velocity is a vector, right? 10 miles an hour, that's a number, and I tell you, north. If you ever have a velocity, you have a magnitude, a number, and a direction. Well, if I multiply these two together, I'm basically making my velocity, I'm scaling it up by mass. Well, this is going to still have direction, so that means the answer momentum has direction okay what about units for momentum break it down piece by piece we know the units for mass what are they close kilograms the base unit that we always want is kilograms okay what about velocity meters per second okay Momentum has a goofy unit. It doesn't simplify down to something really simple. Like energy simplifies to a joule. Momentum doesn't have its own unit, so it's just a kilogram meter per second. If you ever forget that, go back to your equation. You know the unit for a mass. You know the unit for velocity. You can easily just multiply them and figure out to remind yourself. Now, does anybody remember what happens if I took the force applied and multiplied it by how long that force was applied? Huh? Very close. Work is force times distance. But if I'm applying a force for a certain amount of time, wouldn't I change the momentum of an object? I push on it, I make it go faster and faster. How does it change the momentum? The bowling ball is rolling, and I push on it and make it roll faster. Has the momentum gone up or down, or stay the same? It's gone up. It's gone up. I push in the same direction. Well, if I apply a force for a set amount of time, impulse. Change in momentum. That makes sense to us. If I got an object that's got certain momentum, it's just doing its thing, it's inertia in motion, it's just staying rolling, and I apply a force to it, I'm going to change that momentum, no matter what. I'm either going to increase it or decrease it. Well, however long I push on it determines how much the momentum changes. 
change in momentum is what we call impulse. So if I have a graph of the force applied over time, I apply this set force onto the object for a long period of time, the area under that curve is force multiplied by time. Force times time is the impulse, right? You guys remember that? How about this one? So our first thought is, wait, impulse is force times time. Well, the time makes sense from I start here and I go all the way here. But wait a minute, my force, I don't know which one to use. It changes over time. How do I find the impulse? How do I find the area underneath this curve? Answer that question from basic geometry. No, not quite. I'm wanting area. I've got to have multiplication. What's the area of a triangle? One half times the base. One half base times height. What's the base in this problem? Time. time. Zero to whatever the time is, that is my base. What is my height? It is, but is it right here? Is it this force? Is it this force? The maximum. This max force is how high the other leg of my triangle is. I uh, divide by half because it's a triangle. So a lot of times they'll give you a graph, they'll make it tricky. It's not a, an equation. They'll give you a graph and ask you to find impulse, which is force times time. If you ever have something goofy, right, it's not the actual equation. You have to find the area under the curve. And then just so you know, this is where, if you were in AP Physics C, you could do this, but you would do it via calculus. Those of you in calculus, I think Maggie and Ethan, are you guys in calc? No? Just you? Well, how do you find the area under a curve? The integral. Integral. <laughs> Earlier, doing that, I don't know why I said the derivative. You take the integral. It's a calculus calculation. You would get a function for this curve, take the integral from here to here. Answer would be the work, or excuse me, the impulse. In AP Calc, you could do this problem easily. They'd give you the function, you'd take the integral, ta da. That's when calculus and physics they overlap, they're fundamentally intertwined. But, for you guys, you don't need to do that. All you need to know is, if you have force and time, the area underneath that curve is going to be impulse. Area under the curve is basically going to be some geometric shape. A rectangle, literally base times height. It's a triangle, one half base times height. This is your impulse, change in momentum. It's equal to the force applied on the object for times how long you apply the force. You can change momentum by either applying a bigger force for a certain amount of time or apply that force for longer periods of time. You're giving it more momentum. I want you to be careful. A lot of you guys might say like, okay, I have a force. It creates an impulse and changes the momentum. So you would calculate it and say, this is my new momentum. No. no. Impulse is the change. It's how much it either goes up or down. So you would take the impulse that you would calculate and either add it to the original or subtract it if it happened to be negative. So just be careful. This is the change in momentum. That's what an impulse does. It changes momentum. You have to add that change to what you started with if you're finding out the final. This should be hidden if you did a lab. Okay, collisions. 
Remember, collisions were the big part of momentum. Really, if you get a physics question about momentum, it's almost, pos almost certainly a collision question. Two types of collisions. What's one of them? Inelastic. It's the first type of collision. You guys remember what an inelastic collision meant? They get stuck together. That's the key. What's an inelastic collision? It's if they stick together. Right? So I'm reminding you, hey, the any sticking collision is inelastic. Do you guys remember? Actually, this has it right here. You guys remember the name for this relationship? This concept in physics that says whatever momentum you start with is the same as what you end with? Remember what that law? There you go. Very good. Conservation momentum means that momentum is conserved. Can't create it, can't destroy it. It stays the same. That is true for both inelastic and elastic collisions. That's the second type we're going to talk about. Any sort of collision, you always conserve your momentum. Total momentum before is the same afterwards. Well, you got two objects, and they're about to collide. I need to find the momentum of each of them individually. Then a collision happens, and since it's inelastic, they're going to stick together. They become a single object. That single object has a mass of part one plus part two, and it's moving at a certain speed. This is what your conservation of momentum is going to look like for inelastic collisions. Two separate things with their own masses, their own velocities, are going to come together and collide. And if it's inelastic, they stick together. So now they become one object. Obviously, the new mass is part one plus part two. And you've got to figure out, typically, what is the new velocity? Now, what does KE stand for? Kinetic energy. This is the part that a lot of you guys are going to get flipped. It's true that any collision, any elastic or elastic, you conserve your momentum. Law of conservation of momentum says so. However, during inelastic collisions, when two objects come and they stick together, you do not conserve kinetic energy. You can't say 1 half mv squared for the first one plus 1 half mv squared for the second one is equal to 1 half m1 m2 nu v squared. That is not true when you have inelastic collisions or sticking collisions. It's really important to note. Some of the AP problems will ask you, like, was this collision elastic? Explain why you know that. The reasoning you would say is of yes it was and here's why is if you can show that whatever the kinetic energy is before and after, if it's the same before and after the collision, that is your evidence that it was elastic. Inelastic, if you can prove that, hey, this energy that I started with isn't equal to the energy after the collision, there's your evidence that, no, it was inelastic. I'm going to show it's still <laughs> doing what it's supposed to. All right. We've got a hold of inelastic collisions. Momentum is conserved, just like any other collision, but you do not conserve kinetic energy. Does this equation make sense? Yes. MV for the first object plus MV for the second. Add it up and find the total. That total is the same at the end, but at the end you now have this new object where you combine the masses and it has its own combined velocity. So inelastic, or excuse me, elastic. These are bouncing collisions. Billiards, right? Pool ball. Perfect example, actually one of the best examples of elastic collisions. 
Elastic collisions, I actually don't think they actually happen in reality. I don't think it's possible to have a truly 100% elastic collision. Billiards, pool balls, when they collide, it's one of the closest approximations to a completely elastic collision. Crazy physics, sometimes we simplify and say, assume these objects collide elastically. So you conclude, okay, it's elastic. What does that mean? Well, wait, in an elastic collision, do I conserve momentum? Doesn't matter what I said. If I said collision, I conserve momentum. Do I conserve kinetic energy? Yes. Elastic or bouncing collisions conserve kinetic energy. If I have two objects with the same mass and the same velocity come together, and they collide elastically, what happens? Yes. Yes, the, the, they literally will bounce off each other and go off at the exact same speeds. Because the, they each have an equal amount of energy. They have to have the same amount of energy after the collision, which means they perfectly bounce off each other. Also, when you do the momentum calculation, you have object one and object two with starting speed of each. At the end, they do not stick together. They're still separate objects. So I have to do two momentums. One of them is the final speed of object one. The other is final speed of object two. This all has to be equal to each other. Most of the time, you're going to be given this except for, say, final speed of the second object. That's what you're trying to find, so you have to use this, show that you know what conservation of momentum is, set up the equation, and do your algebra for the missing variable. Or you're going to have to use this idea in like an FRQ, right? Which way does the object go? I think you had one similar to that on your test. You use this idea of, wait, it's a collision. Momentum's conserved. I can use that to figure out different things. Yeah. So this is an example. Sorry, give me one sec. Oh, it's at the end of the spool. It's a spool of filament, so it's lined up, and then it goes back from itself, and it just got to the end, so it keeps clicking, and it's pulling all the way across. Sorry. So this is an example. You have an object before and after. This object is hitting the black puck, which was at rest. After this happens, you have to look at, these are the momentums. Right? This is the direction and magnitude of the incoming object. It's got a high velocity. After it collides, it bounces off this way with a lot less velocity. This puck gets launched. It's a big vector. It's a big momentum in that direction. Well, both are important. If I take these vectors, when you add vectors, you add tip to tail. You have to put them, keep them in the same orientation. If these are the resulting momentums, this would have to be the same vector as what happened originally. And you see that that's true. Right? Adding vectors is basically adding the missing leg of a triangle, so to speak. Well, it just so happens the missing leg of the triangle of the end parts is exactly the same as what you have to begin with. Starting equals final pieces. So that's a visual demonstration of, okay, in a collision, these momentum, it's not just numbers equaling each other. These vectors, these directions make sense. Right? They come together and bounce off each other. Well, those two parts are the same thing, same vector as what happened originally. I think if there's other things I want to mention now. Any questions about 
equations, this diagram, anything I reviewed briefly now. <laughs> so, um, honestly, pool is incredibly mathematical, right? If people are good at pool, they're actually really good at trigonometry. Right? If I come, if I hit the wall at this angle, it's going to come off at this angle, and that's going to head to this pocket. So I need to shift my shot so that the angles line up so that that ball goes to that pocket. Momentum, it's a bunch of collisions. If I hit this really hard, I'm going to transfer all that momentum into this object, and it's going to go too fast. Or it's not going to have enough momentum, right? Uh, I do want to go through so a lot of this we talked about. What I want to point your attention back to, big ideas, right? If you're like, oh, I don't know momentum at all, where should I start reviewing? Right here. These are these key concepts, key things that you can, you should know and you can oftentimes use, say, for FRQ. Uh, inertia and motion is our conceptual idea of, wait, what was momentum? It's the inertia or mass of an object in motion. Those, that is what momentum is. You calculate it by taking the mass times the velocity. The units we talked about, you forget them. This is kilograms, this is meters per second. So the units are kilogram meter per second. Impulse. Impulse is what we call the change in momentum. You change momentum by applying a force for a specific amount of time. If you do that, you have changed the momentum. You've created an impulse. Impulses always change the momentum. Impulse of 20 newton seconds. Looks weird, but wait a minute. Impulse was just force times time. Newtons times seconds. Causes a change in momentum of 20. It does not mean the final momentum equals 20. It's just the change. You have to add that back to the original. Uh, oftentimes you'll see impulse as a capital J. This isn't the unit of joules, capital J. It's not a unit, it's a variable. If you see a, a variable saying capital J, that's an impulse. Um, average is what we're talking about with the triangle, right? That force is changing as of being applied over time. So what is the force that I'm multiplying by time? Well, none of them. If you wanted to, you can find the average and do it that way. This is an important thing. If objects bounce, that is a larger impulse than if it just stops dead. You guys remember my example that I asked you guys? What is worse? Uh, driving your car into a brick, solid brick wall and coming to a dead stop. Or bouncing off the wall after you collide into it. Worse? Yeah, which one is worse? What is bouncing more bouncing damaging? Bouncing off. Because then it's like you go back into traffic. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I was going for. <laughs> but, but think about it. If you've got a car, you conserve momentum in a collision. So if I have a car and a brick wall, I have a certain momentum and the wall has none, and I collide, my momentum has to be conserved. Right? Technically, you would move the wall a little bit. Yeah, technically you would have this massive wall that you would move very slowly. Because that wall has so much mass, it soaks up all the momentum. You're combined now, and you move it a little bit, and eventually friction slows it down. But wait a minute, if I have my car, and I come into a brick wall, and I bounce straight off, it's an elastic collision. Right? Right? My momentum, not all, I have positive momentum coming in. When I hit that wall and bounce off, I have negative momentum. 
So not only do I have to bring the momentum, I have to decrease the momentum down to zero. But since it bounced, I have to give it negative momentum. That's twice as much change in momentum as just colliding with the wall. That's when you get away from the wall. Huh? That's when you get whiplash. Yeah, it is. We, you know this by looking at momentum. To conserve momentum, it's harder to stop an object and give it negative momentum than it is to just stop an object or take the momentum away. Area under the curve, area under force time graph was impulse. We talked about that. This was um, conservation momentum. The momentum that you start with is the same as the momentum that you end with. In a collision, you conserve that momentum. Inelastic collisions, they stick together. That's what the conservation momentum looks like. Energy is not conserved when it's inelastic. They stick together and it's inelastic. You're not, you don't worry about energy. You don't really know what's happening with the energy for sure. Elastic collisions, when they bounce, that's what your equation will look like. You have objects one and two have momentum separately at the beginning and end. You do conserve um, kinetic energy. So you can combine conservation of momentum and conservation of kinetic energy. You can use both equations to figure things out if it's elastic. Here's conservation of momentum. Here's conservation of energy. Between those two equations, you have a lot of options to solve for anything. Newton's cradle. You guys remember Newton's cradle? You have to, uh, usually it's like five balls, and you take one, and you lift it up. When you let it go, the object has momentum, and right before it hits, it's got a set amount of momentum. The ball has mass, and the ball has a certain velocity. Well, when it hits all of the other balls, that momentum gets transferred to the other one. And at the end, nothing's stopping the ball, so that momentum moves it forward. Uh, metal balls have fairly elastic collisions, so you're also conserving the energy. What happens if I have all this kinetic energy and it swings a pendulum really up? Comes back down. Tell me about the energy that's happening there. All this kinetic energy. Why does it stop and then come back down? Where did all the kinetic energy go? Potential. The ball is moving itself up until it runs out of kinetic energy. Then why does it fall back down? All the potential energy is released, and gravity pushes back down. Yeah, and then you do the exact same thing in reverse. And it keeps going. Theoretically, it would happen infinitely, but reality is there's friction. You release some sound. There's friction in the strings, all that stuff. We talked about the vector nature. If you have collisions in x and y direction, not just cars bounce and come off each other, that's one direction. But billiards, that's two-dimensional collisions. You kind of treat each direction independently. Momentum is a vector. Mass times velocity. Velocity is a vector. But kinetic energy is not. I can't tell you that I have 10 joules of energy going north. That's nowhere in the kinetic energy equation. Mass and velocity squared, they're just numbers. So don't get momentum and energy confused. Momentum is a vector. Energy is not. And the reason that's important is your directions matter. If I'm going three, if I have three kilogram meter per second this way and three this way, what's my total? What's three? Zero. Well, I guess three plus negative three. Zero. Zero. Because they're different directions. What if it happens if I have three joules of energy and three joules of energy? What's my total energy? Six. Six. Couldn't care less what direction the energy is pointed. Energy is energy. So you add them up. That's something that will trip you up. 
Momentum is a vector. You care about the direction. The direction determines if it's positive or negative. That accounts for how you add them together. Energy doesn't matter. It's just a bunch of numbers. You add them together. All right. Any other questions about momentum? Again, kind of high-level review, equation, getting it back on our mind, conservation of energy. What, what are two important things about e inelastic collisions? They stick together. Okay, I guess give me three things. Kinetic energy is not conserved. Kinetic energy is not conserved. It's inelastic. What's the other important thing about specifically the momentum of inelastic collisions? I couldn't hear that. Momentum is conserved. Momentum is conserved. It's a collision. Momentum is always conserved in collisions. Okay, how about elastic collisions? You got both of them, right? Yeah. Momentum is conserved. Of course, it's a collision. Duh. But since it's elastic, you're also conserving kinetic energy. What type of collision do we call elastic? Bouncing. Bouncing. That's, that's the idea. They, they come together and they bounce off each other. Inelastic are when they stick together. Okay? Any other questions? Okay, so I have, I found an FRQ that is dead focused on momentum. It's, it's an ABC. It's asking you to look at, actually, it's momentum with motion. So unit one, our kinematic stuff. Right? Equate, or momentum is about collisions. Collisions are motion. So it's going to pull some of that in. It's going to have you use the conservation momentum, figure out which type of equation. And actually, that is literally the last part, is identifying what type of collision it is based on what you've done. So I have this one. This is... The grading was really weird for this. I don't think it matches their current grading scale. I think it should be like an eight-point-ish question. So again, roughly two minutes per point for FRQs. So we'll do eight times two is 16. So I'll set a timer for 16-ish minutes. Again, that, that's your pacing. You should be able to get this done. But that's your goal is to finish this within that time frame. And then we'll come together and I'll see if you got questions. We'll solve it together, figure out what's going on. Okay, and then the rest of the time, I tried to go quicker today. The rest of the time, I'm going to give you work time on your homework, ask me additional questions, work on old homework, ask me random physics questions, whatever you need. So go ahead, you guys can. Yeah, we do, which is. I felt bad because I always seem to take up all the time. I talk too long, teach too long. So I'll give you this, I'll set my timer. And then once we're done, we'll come together and I'll go through this as a class. Um, and then we'll have work time for whatever you need to get done.